good morning to my church family this morning, as well as those that are watching from home. Let us clear our minds and hearts as we go into prayer right now. In the name of Jesus. Father God, we come to you this morning grateful, thankful, and praising your holy name. We thank you, Father God, as it says in Genesis, that in the beginning you created, Father God, this world that we are living in and all that is in it. And we're in it, Father God. And that's because you're such a mighty king. Father God, we thank you that we can come to you this morning, Father God, with heavy hearts and know that, Father God, when we leave this place, we will not be the same as what we came in with. We'll leave it all here at the altar, all our burdens, all our cares and concerns, because you are mighty God. Father God, we thank you that in Psalm 23, you are our shepherd. And that's the relationship that we have with you, Father God. So we thank you for our relationship with you, Lord. Not that we've done anything so good, but Father, because you're so good to us. Hallelujah. For the love that you give us, Lord, is unconditional. And we thank you. As we get ready to hear the word, Father God, we thank you for the servant that is going to come forth and bring the word that will touch each and every heart, each and every mind, each and every ear that will hear what thus says the Lord. And we know, Father God, that soon you will come. And you will come quickly, as it says in Revelation 20. So, Father God, excuse me, Revelation 22. So, Father God, we say thank you. We ask for forgiveness of things we've done and said that are not pleasing unto you, Lord, so that we can be worthy, Father God, to hear the word this morning, to receive the word this morning. And, Father God, that our praises that we send to you, Father God, will be accepting in your sight. So let us continue to be obedient to the word this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you honor, praise, and glory, Lord, for you are so worthy. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Let us all be seated at this time. And as I stand before you this morning, on behalf of Pastor Paul and First Lady Florence Nicholas of CCA, here in Clinton, Maryland, our church family, we're thanking you this morning and welcoming you this morning in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Our announcements for the week are food pickup this Saturday at 1 o'clock. We are still at a 50% capacity with masks and social distancing. And we will be still online services as well for safety for our people. We thank everyone for staying plugged in this season and everyone continuing their faithful, faithful support of the ministry and allowing us to give away hundreds of boxes and even 50 plus turkeys this past week for Thanksgiving. That is because God is so good and God is, makes his provisions all the time for all his people. Thank God always because he gives seed to the sower in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Is it CCA? Come on, put the little gusto behind you. It's worship time. The time that we're very happy because we got a chance to 
show God what we're made of. You understand? And give him thanks for all that he has done for us. I want to read from you to you from uh, Malachi 3.10 to begin with. And um, it says here, uh, bring all the tithes into the, the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven or pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And for those of you who might not know, we are constantly giving to our community and we are constantly remembering those who cannot give and who do not have to eat. We must do that at all times. If you pray with me, please. Father God, you are the giver of all good things. And as your word declares, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Father God, we ask you to accept these gifts and to use them to your glory. May these gifts bring comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. Just as you multiplied the offering of fish, and the loaves that were freely given for others, we pray that you would multiply these our offerings to you and accomplish with them more than we could ever fathom or even imagine. Father God, thank you for enabling us to give to your kingdom and bless us to be always able to give generously to your body. Father God, help those who had a desire to give, but circumstances did not allow them. Bless them so that they can contribute in the future. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
not hold him down. We do serve a risen, risen king. Amen. Amen. And we just thank you, oh God, for being our king, our savior, our Lord. And we thank you, oh God, for the opportunity to be in your presence. One more time. We don't take it for granted, oh God. It is your grace and mercy that keeps us going. And we are especially thankful during this time, Lord, of the pandemic, and during this time when we realize all the things that we have taken for granted. Father, we ask right now, I ask that you pray with me, that you forgive us, oh God, for taking so much for granted. And oh God, if it took this pandemic for us to realize all that you do for us, Lord. But God, we thank you. We thank you so much. And God, as we come this morning, oh God, we ask, oh God, that I might decrease and you increase, God, that you would use me for your glory and for your honor, that you would open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom, oh God, that you would open our spirits so that we would know your leading and guidance, and open our hearts, oh God, so that we may receive your wonderful, wondrous love. What love, what marvelous love you have for us. And Lord God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, oh God, my strength and my redeemer. You may pre-mark your Bible to two portions, Ephesians 6 and 2 Chronicles 20. Amen. Amen. On last week, we spoke about trusting God in hard times. And if we're going to trust God, we mentioned that we need to do a few things. We mentioned at least five things we need to do at a minimum. We need to give up our right to understand everything. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And we need to run to the throne of grace, not walk, not hesitate, but run to God in prayer. Prayer changes things. And we need to remember God's character. God is not man. God is unchanging. He's everywhere. He knows all things. He loves us with an everlasting love. And we are to recall our count how God has delivered us. And when we do this, I just admonish everyone, especially those who are Parent, grandparents, parents, nieces, uh, have nieces and nephews and aunties and all that, and especially great-grandparents, that we have a responsibility that people know what God has done for us. Don't take it for granted. Don't let them wonder. Tell them what God has done. They need to know your testimony. They need to know how God has delivered you and what he has brought you from. And the next point is to always be checking ourselves by the word of God, because doubt will creep in just to rob us of that relationship, to rob us of our belief if we are not careful. So we need to continue stirring up the gift of God in us. And as we talked about trust, we talked about it being a bold confidence sure security or action based on that security. And trust not being the same as faith. Trust is what we do because we have faith. And as I was meditating this week, God said, but well, you hadn't told them they have faith. You told them to trust. You told them what to trust, what, what they should be expecting. But do people really know that they have faith? And so today, we will focus on how we live if we have the God kind of faith. 
And the God kind of faith, when we speak of faith, is the very same faith that God used to speak the universe into be existence. The same faith he used to make man. The same faith. And so when we speak of the God kind of faith, we have that. And I just want you all to know from the depth of my heart, never question whether you have the God kind of faith. Once you come to Christ, once you've asked him to be your Lord and Savior, you have the God kind of faith. Amen. Because as we believe with our, our heart, then we have two parts. We have to believe with our hearts, but we have got to speak what we believe. And this is sometimes where we fall short. You know, we are praying and we are asking God to change things, but we keep speaking what we see. Mm -hmm. And the God kind of faith call those things that be not as though they were. Mm -hmm. And in Mark 11, 23 and 24, it says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So it's a hard issue and it's a word issue when we talk about our faith. Amen. And if they are not the same, we are being double-minded. And in the book of James, it said a double-minded person is unstable in not some, but all of his ways. So if we're going to fight the good fight of faith, that means that we need to stand firmly anchored in the word of, and in the power of the spirit. And we have to reckon ourselves to be dead to our feelings and our human reasoning. Not letting sin rule over us in our mortal, mortal bodies, but, by, oh, uh, uh, but we need to obey Jesus, live like Jesus lived, believe that he empowers us because he's done so much for us already and he has left in the earth ran the Holy Spirit to guide us and to direct us. But also, we've got to do one other thing and that is to take up our cross daily and deny ourselves. And we can't, I want you to rest assured that if you are in Christ, you have faith. And the book of Romans 12, 13. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Everyone has a measure of faith. And with that faith, you cry out to God and you shall be saved. For if we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth, and we have repented, we have faith. Faith is for Christians. The Bible was written to the believer. Amen. Faith is for Christians. So if we've accepted Jesus, then we have the God kind of faith. So when it talks about the measure of faith, it's, uh, it's not available for everyone in the world who hasn't accepted it. But once you come to Christ, you have that measure of faith. And I impress upon you, and I stress, you have the same kind of faith that Jesus had. It's not a different kind of faith. It was his faith that allowed him to walk the earth as a man. It is his faith that caused him to do it everything that he did for us, to deny himself, to sacrifice, to go to the cross. And it's also his faith that caused him to rise again. So we do save a risen savior. And the measure of faith is for every believer. So if you call yourself a Christian, amen, amen, you have faith, you have the God kind of faith. 
And it may seem to you that, well, it seems to me that some people have such great faith, and you may look at your faith as puny. People develop their faith. That's how it grows. So faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if your faith is not where you want it to be and what you think it ought to be, then what do we have to do? We've got to hear the word of God more. So how do we hear the word of God? We hear it by speaking it. We hear it by reading it. We hear it by listening to it, meditating on it. We hear the word. Faith comes, don't ever forget, by hearing and hearing the word. So where your faith is, is an indication of what the word is in you. Ooh, so we need to fight the good fight of faith. And it is lived out on a daily basis. So if you're in a fight, and life is a fight, this is not a cakewalk. We wrestle, we fight, we strive, we make plans. We ask God to direct us and we move out. We have faith to do those things. But if we're gonna fight the good fight of faith, the first thing that we need to know is who the enemy is. Mm -hmm. And that's why I asked you to pre-mark to um, Ephesians 6. We're going to go through that. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, mm -hmm. but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Oftentimes, we get our enemies confused. Your brother, your sister, your co-worker, they are not the enemy. They are not that good. They might be influenced, but they are not the enemy. No matter how much they may prick your nerves and make you want to tell them off, they are not your enemy. Your enemy, evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, mighty powers in the dark world, and evil spirit in the heavenly places. That's our enemies. We need to focus, focus on who our enemy is. And many times we are focusing on what we can see and what we can touch, but what we can see, what we can touch, that's not the enemy. The enemy remains threefold. Don't forget that when you're in this fight on a daily basis, you are not fighting people. The second thing we need to know, we are in a fight, there's a real enemy, and the, we have the equipment, we have the necessary tools to fight, and it is not a knife, and it's not a gun, it's not an AKA, whatever they call it. This fight is real, and God has given us the equipment to fight, and that is in Ephesians 6. And we'll start at the 10th verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
That is your weaponry. The whole armor, the belt of truth, first part of your weapon. And the truth is the truth. It's not 50%, it's not 99%. 99% truth is still a whole lie. And I dare to say that as we look for gray and shaded areas of truth. A 99% truth is a total lie. The second piece of the whole armor is the breastplate of righteousness, which we can understand as we look at God's righteous character. God is honorable. God is morally right. God obey laws. He adheres to moral standards. And it's one thing about God. God's word is so powerful that he said he submit himself under his word. Amen. And so there is no error or turning or shadow. God follows God's word. How much more should we as we fight? The third piece of the armor is the gospel of peace. To be effective, we must be able to move around and fellowship and have relationship with other people that are different from us, that are the same, that have different values, but we must walk in peace. As much as lie within us, we should live with, in peace with all men. And to be in peace means we are able to spread the word. And the Great Commission found in Matthew 28th chapter, I think it's 16 through 20, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if we are not actively reaching out to others, and even during the pandemic, you can reach out to others. Amen? Amen. You have a telephone. Many of you have um, face, Facebook and so many other technology and just word of mouth. You, in the grocery store, you stand in those long lines, you might have to be six feet apart, but you can still reach out and you can bless someone. You can share the Lord wherever you are. Wherever we are, we should be in a position to praise God, to see the goodness of God. Not to say, oh, how long this line is, but to say, good. Thank you, Lord, I'm able to stand in this line. We have got to get a vision for what we can do and not for limitations because we still can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. He is not, his arms not short that he cannot save and we have, we're on a mission. And where we live, where we travel, that's our battlefield. That's our Jerusalem. That's the place where we get to take peace. So no matter where we are, we can share the good news of the gospel. The fourth part of the weapon of your armor is the shield of faith. And why would faith be represented in the armor? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We know that since Satan is the father of lies, and those who do not believe in Jesus, they try to challenge our faith at every hand. But having faith in God and his promises, knowing what the word says, that will shield, will protect us from doubts, and from lies thrown to us from the world. That's why we need that shield. And the helmet of salvation. The helmet is for your head. Amen. Amen. And it's a very crucial piece of the spiritual armor. When you think about your head, your brain is there. Uh, I mean, the activities, everything that you can do comes out from, the, it's so critical to protect our head, our minds, and we get to toss out doubt about our salvation, 
that people try to plan in our minds. Salvation is not something we acquire on our own, but rather it is a precious gift that we do not deserve, but God so loved the world that he came into the world not to condemn the world, but that through Christ the world might be saved. So we need that protection of the helmet. And the sixth part of the armor is the sword of the spirit. And that's the key weapon in our spiritual arsenal. God has given us to win the battle against the devil, the world's influence, and our own sin nature. No Bible passage describes it more clearly than Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, because it talks about the power of the word of God. And it said, for the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierced into the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is discerner the thoughts and intents of our heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight. So that's why we need the world. Everything is naked and exposed to the eye of him to whom we must give an account. God knows all. But to be able to separate the soul and the spirit, only God can do that. To be able to separate the joint and the marrow. And we have such powerful, powerful weapons. And you may say, well, all those weapons are from my front. What about my back? Well, if we think our sisters and our brothers have our back. How much more does God have our back? Amen. There's no weapon for the back that's, that's described, but we know God has us. Amen. The third thing that I want to impress upon you this morning is that how we approach the battle is critical. We have the weaponry. We have our place and we are ready to go to war. And one other thing I want to say about the, the weapons of our warfare. There is no scripture that I have found, and if you have, please bring it to my attention, to tell you to take your war clothes off. We are supposed to be clothed with those elements. And it doesn't say take it off. So, you know, we don't get to undress once we come to Christ, this is a battle that we have for the duration of our life. Amen? Amen. The third thing is how you approach the battle, and that's why we're going to 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. And how we face battle is critical. We can go with mourning and complaining, we can go with all of the strategy on what ifs, but we can also go to the battle fully clothed and fully persuaded that God is who he says he is and he does what he says he does. And in Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, this is a time in Judah's history when the enemy was coming against them. And Jehoshaphat is now king. And Jehoshaphat, um, when he saw all that was arrayed against them as a nation, he was trembling. But he had a mind to call upon the Lord. And he didn't do it in secret. When we depend on the Lord, we don't need to be concerned about doing it in secret because he said to put me in remembrance of my word and we need to allow our loved ones to see what we are trusting the Lord for so that they can see his delivering hand. Amen. That's very critical and that's why we have to tell what the Lord has done for us. And the enemy is coming against them and Joshua, re he, he's looking and he is saying, oh my God, there are 
grossly outnumbered. Grossly outnumbered, but that, it's not about the number of people or the number of enemy force that's against you. Satan desires to sift all of us who are blood-bought like wheat. And, but you know, when you sift, then what is left and remains is good. Amen? Amen? But that's when you're in the sifting process. So there will be that which remains. When we are in battle, we know we're in battle, we are fully clothed, ready for battle, then how we go into the battle is with praise and worship. And it's not about your feeling. It's about the strategy. If you want to be victorious, then you have got to do the God thing and not the human thing. It's not about your feeling. It's about what God says. It doesn't matter how the odds are stacked against you. It's about what God says. Jehoshaphat know that in the natural, based on the size of the enemy, there was no way on a natural playing basis that he could win this war, that the nation was already defeated if you looked at that. But um, starting at the 12th verse, um, Jeho Jehoshaphat has spread the letter. He told the people, and he said, Oh, our God, are you not judge? Uh, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Never take your eyes off of God. He is the solution. You are not, no, none of your friends, they are not. God has the solution. Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives and their children, stood before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Hesiel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen all you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. See, we look at the battle being ours and what we have got to do. But if God doesn't move on our behalf, we're all out of here. Amen. It is he who doeth the work, not us. We've got to keep ourselves clothed, be ready, but it is God who moves for us. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeriel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. As strong as you are, you are not capable of defeating the enemy. Remember, the enemy is invisible. We don't even see in that realm. And that's why we need to commit ourselves fully to the Lord. Because once we do our part, we are under the word. The word is in us. We are clothed for battle. We are positioned ourselves. And we are going out, and we'll read on how they go out. Then we will see the Lord's hand move. You will not need to fight. Position yourself. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Korhites 
and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. We, in our own strength and our limited ability and knowledge, we are no match for principalities, for evil spirits, but we serve a God who sees all, knows all, and who loves us with an everlasting love, and he is able to tear down, to pluck up, to uproot everything that we need in our lives, in Jesus' name. So we need to always be mindful that the battle belongs to the Lord, but our part is to stay clothed for battle. This is no mystery. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when our faith, if you're not satisfied with where your faith is today, that doesn't mean that that's it. Ever increasing faith. How do we increase our faith? Through hearing the word of God. And so we can be rightly positioned to grow and to be all that God wants for us to be. Now God has called us and he, before we were in our mother's womb, he called us, he chose us, and he gave a certain mission to each one of us. Everybody's work and everybody's mission is not the same. But it doesn't mean that our faith should not be exceedingly growing so that we can do our part. The body functions on gifts and diversity of gifts, but when we are fully clothed, fully positioned, then we can do all the things that God has called us to be and to do. And we need to fully trust that God is all he says he is, especially in times like these. But when the good times are, let us not forget that he is still all powerful, all knowing, and he's still everywhere. And there is nothing that we come up against that he's not aware of. And there is nothing that we come up against that he cannot defeat on our behalf. So let us pray. Father, I acknowledge that if I don't have you, I will not be able to fight right. And so Father God, right now, for those who are listening and who have not made that decision to ask you, oh God, to be the Lord of their life, Right now, in the name of Jesus, this is your time to submit yourself to to ask him to come into your heart and to be the savior of your life. Confess your sin and covenant to share your belief with someone else. Because those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. And when we have persecution, and sorrow, God will give us the strength to fight the good fight of faith. There is a good fight. Lord, keep our heads high and our eyes always on you. 
Give us, Lord, insight, new insight, oh God, confidence and faith in praying, believing that we receive what we ask of you, oh God. You are our righteousness and our own peace. Teach us, oh God, to be content in all situations. Keep us to not be disheveled about who you are because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for being our Lord, for being our Savior. And we thank you, O oh God, for fully equipping us to live out our lives in faith. We bless you. O oh God, you are our glory and the lifter of our head. Thank you, O oh God, for ministering to us today. Thank you, Lord, for your comfort. Thank you for your peace. And thank you, Lord, that we can have confidence always in who you are and what you do and what we possess as we love you, know you, and grow in you. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that the peace of your presence will never depart from us. Bless us as we go and let your love always be our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.